At the very tip of Africa, in a place rich with culture, scenic destination, and colorful people, there's adventure waiting for you. To our world's future leaders and thinkers, we understand. We understand curiosity, motivation, ambition, and passion. We understand big thinking and bigger dreams. At Nelson Mandela University, we have everything you need to study quality higher education, meet new people, absorb new cultures, learn new languages, open new doors, make a difference, and change the world. Live life beyond lectures with Nelson Mandela University, your home away from home. You don't have to have a college degree to serve. You don't have to make your subject and verb agree in order to serve. You only need a heart full of grace and a soul generated by love. This, ladies and gentlemen, is a quotation by Martin Luther King, Jr. Good evening, Deputy Vice Chancellors, Members of Council, Dean Professor Lloyd, Deputy Dean Professor May, our esteemed guest, Dr. Suleiman, colleagues, students, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this public lecture hosted by our Dean of the Faculty of Business and Economic Sciences, Professor Hendrik Lloyd, in celebration of the anniversary of the five-year name change of the Nelson Mandela University from the original Nelson Mandela Metropolitan University. It is also an immense privilege to welcome this evening Dr. Imtiaz Suleiman to our beautiful campus and the city of Kabecha, Port Elizabeth. The quotation by Martin Luther King Jr. sets the perfect tone for the purpose of our gathering here this evening. As I introduce you to our Dean of the Faculty, to welcome you, he will showcase how the work of Dr. Suleiman perfectly reflects the vision of faculty as well as the values of our university. Prior to handing over the podium to Professor Lloyd, please note the following. Should you require to use the bathrooms, these can be found to the right of the venue as you exit this venue. Please switch off all mobile phones or turn to silent mode. There will be a short opportunity after Dr. Suleiman's presentation to pose questions to him, and a roving microphone will be provided. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, and I introduce you to our Dean, Professor Hendrik Lloyd. Thank you, uh, Dr. Dean, for the ceremonies. Dr. Suleiman, colleagues from here to the Gillers, esteemed colleagues, friends of the faculty and the university, honored guests, it is um, our privilege to welcome you to this public lecture, also in celebration of our five year name change from Nelson Mandela Metropolitan University to Nelson Mandela University. Of course, this lecture is aptly entitled, I Am Because of Others. And that is exactly what our university is also. We are because of you. And our stakeholders, our students, our alumni, and our partners in how we take our business forward in this city. It's also a privilege and an honor to welcome you tonight, Dr. Suleiman, as you will deliver this public lecture to us and showcase how the values of the gift of the givers and yourself resonate and align perfectly with the values of our beloved university. And especially if we look at the value of Ubuntu in terms of we are because of others. Also, of course, it aligns with the other values of integrity, 
respect and excellence. A public lecture such as tonight plays a pivotal role in showcasing one of our academic missions, namely that of engagement. But it also perfectly aligns with the other two missions, namely that of learning and teaching and that of research. Tonight's lecture will provide us with a small glimpse into the life and doings of Dr. Suleiman and how he lives the vision of the gift of the givers, where he brings dignity to people, where he saves lives through his actions, where he eases pain and suffering, and where he shares care and compassion. All of this links perfectly to the Nelson Mandela University motto of being in service to society and link to the values and the visions of our namesake and our beloved former president, Nelson Mandela. Of course, tonight's lecture also makes it very special for us to welcome Dr. Suleiman here because in 2016, we had the privilege to also bestow an honorary doctorate on Dr. Suleiman to acknowledge the wonderful work that he and his organization is doing. So without me, Saying any further, let me read a short resume of Dr. Suleiman. I'm sure it's not needed, but I, just as a reminder of what an exceptional person he is and the organization that he's founded. Born in parts of Struan, Northwest Province, the importance of community to Dr. Suleiman's life started in a small town where he lived with his family in a communal atmosphere. He began his schooling in Potchefstroom and later on moved to Susky College in Durban. He qualified as a medical doctor at the then University of Natal Medical School in 1984. A career he would of course later give up in service for his passions for humanitarian aid. As an inspirational founder, director and visionary of Gift of the Givers, a South African founded NGO in 1992, years ago. He has been instrumental in changing the lives of millions of people across 41 countries in the world. Gift of the Givers is the largest response NGO, disaster response NGO on the African continent and of course from African origin and that's important to kind of emphasize and also is the only agency uh, of such a nature accredited by the proud leaves of African Foundation. Gift of the Givers is responsible for a series of firsts, for example, innovating the world's only containerized mobile hospital, the world's first ground nut, soya, high energy, and protein supplement. And also, they possess the only life locator, a device used in Africa, a device used to detect people that's buried under rubble during disaster events. As the leader of the foundation, Dr. Suleiman has traveled to some of the most war-torn areas on this continent, places like Syria, Haiti, and Bosnia. He also shares a particular interest and is a continuous supporter of the people of Palestine, and of course, they remain close to his heart. Amongst Dr. Suleiman's numerous awards, he has received the President's Order of the Star of South Africa, an Excellence in Health Award from the South African Medical Association, the Presidential Award for Assistance in the Pakistan Earthquake from President Musharraf, the Paul Harris Award, Rotary's International Highest Award, and in 2010, he also received the highest award in South Africa, the Order of the Boabat in Silver from our then President Jacob Zuma. So, colleagues, that just gives you a very very small glimpse into this remarkable and extraordinary person that we are going to listen to now. So please help me in welcoming Dr. Suleiman to the podium. Thank you, Professor Roy. You, in the beginning, I don't know all of you to introduce, but you said Deputy Vice Chancellors, people from the Senate, people from management, people from the department. Welcome all of you. 
and also as a special message to Kevin Manny, the police commissioner. Thank you very much for coming here. The topic is very, very apt. The name is very apt. Nelson Mandela University. Mandela, what is true for? And what South Africa needs right now? South Africa needs cohesion. It needs working together. It needs Ubuntu. It needs altruism. It needs sacrifice. It requires all the principles to save this country and to save its people. My story starts in 1985, actually. I did not get up one morning. Before they gave us a top organization. I didn't get up one morning and say, I think today I form an organization, give it a name, get, get some founding members, write a constitution, and write our points one, two, three, four, and five, and this is what we do. It never happened that way. The founding of the organization is totally spiritual. And when I go back, it's not 1992, it's 1985. When I speak, the messages that I give you is about life in general. You can apply it in your own life and you can take the lessons from what I say. I say 1985. Because in 1985, I was reading internship in King Edward Hospital in Devon. And at that point, I wanted to study further, to study internal medicine, to specialize in internal medicine. But there was not much opportunity there. So there was no post. I couldn't study further. I was forced to go to private practice, TV practice, something I did not want to do. Now, this is an aside. Quite often in life, we don't get what we want. We have challenges in our personal life, our children, our work, our study. Lots of things don't work out. Instead of getting heartbroken and dejected and depressed, always understand and analyze why that happened. You see, when we pray, we don't pray for what we want. Because what, we pray for what is good for us. Because what we want may not necessarily be good for us. And it's always important to analyze why things don't work out instead of getting heartbroken. And I understood years later why I didn't go into the medicine. It would have been really a waste, but of course, somebody else would rather use that post. So I go into Maris Book, I moved from there to the Maris Book. In January 86. That same week that I get there to start my private practice, an African man from Pretoria moves to Wellesburg also. He keeps, comes to teach French at the University of Natal. My neighbor was a good chap. One day tells me, you know, the African guy came. He bought some meat for me, but he's not a medical problem. He needs a doctor. So me and Mother meet. Patient doctor relationship. And we develop. And over a period of time, he says, I think I know you well enough. And he says, I'm going to tell you a story. He says, I was walking through the streets of New York. I was very down, very much like the moon in South Africa right now. I was very down, rejected, not knowing what to do. My soul and my spirit was feeling empty. And at that point, down the road, I see a man standing in the corner. That man is looking at me. I don't know why, but my soul tells me to follow the man. So I follow the man. And the man walks into St. John the Divine, a huge church in New York. It says, I realize the man, when I walk inside, I realize the man is a Muslim. A Sufi mark, the master of Turkish religion. He said, I see next what happens. In the church, the Sufi master, the Muslim guy, recites a zikr. A second is a celebration of God's name. You chant it. So in English, in a different scriptures, we'll say, one and only, kind, compassionate, merciful, cherisher, nourisher, sustainer, loving, eternal, absolute. And so it goes. He said, why is he was chanting that in the church? He said an amazing thing happened. He said the Jewish rabbis, the Christian priests, the Hindu pandits, and all the delegation of all the different religions joined in. And they did it together. I said, this is incredible. This is even possible. And then I went on to reflect in what he said. You see, over the last several years, religions are blamed for conflict. Religion is not the cause of conflict. People moving away from religion is the cause of conflict. In the same principle, 
and the lawyers steal from their own excellent money, do we shut down the legal profession? When doctors do bad practice, do we shut down the medical profession? When governments are corrupt, do we shut down the system of state and government? When governments do corrupt and unethical behavior, do we shut down profits? No, we don't. We look at the individuals responsible for the different measures and we deal with that. Not with institutions, not with the system. There's nothing wrong with the system. The elders of the church proved there is unity of mankind, unity of religion, unity of purpose, and unity of being. And that same message is what South Africa needs to be. Man and I stand on the And then one day he tells me, You need to go to Turkey. You need to go, can you hear me? Yeah. You need to go to Turkey. So I said, well, it's 1986. I still haven't seen Cape Town. <laughs> <laughs> when am I going to see Turkey? It's important what you said. You said what God wills happens as a time and a place. And that time and the place was August 91. It's a long story, but I got to Turkey. And that night, what I saw was exactly what Murray described, what he saw in New York. Except this was Turkey. It was not a church. It was a Sufi place, a place of a Sufi master, a Sufi tradition place. And when I walked in, you saw everybody. Americans, Russians, Europeans, Germans, Australians, people from Brazil, Brazil. Argentina, Mexico, Southeast Asia, all over Africa in a Muslim holy place. Jews, Christians, Hindus, Muslims, people who said you don't believe. Everybody was welcome. I couldn't understand this. This was post Gulf War. Gulf War, 16 January 1991. Polarized the world. It broke us, broke us up into different groups. Samuel Huntington at that time spoke of the clash of civilizations. The perception was East on one side, West on one side. Jews and Christians on one side, Muslims on the other side. And coming from an apartheid <coughs> past doesn't help. And you walk into the place and you see this and you can't believe this is really happening. I felt the power of the spirituality in that very minute. The spiritual teacher I'm supposed to be looks at me once and he makes eye contact. And something happens in my soul. And then I get a shock. He doesn't ask me. Normally when a guest comes to host, from somewhere far. Hello, how are you? How's the trip? Where did you come from? Did you eat something? Did somebody take care of you? His first question was none of the other. His first question was, what do you see? Because he, he realized, he spoke to the soul, that what I saw was troubling me. I said, I'm confused. They said again, what do you see? I said, I see people from all religions. All colors, all countries here in the Muslim holy place. And we fought with them in the wars all over the world. He said, You're right. You see, right? And then he explains. He says, Mankind is one single nation. The God of all mankind is one. We just call it by different names. Any Imam, Sheikh, Sufi, priest, rabbi, pandit, or anybody else who preaches, and promotes extremism, terrorism, discord, conflict, and disorder is not a man of God. Don't follow him. Anyone who teaches love, kindness, and compassion is a man of God. Follow him. And then he explains. He said, you see, we don't judge an entire religion, an entire nation, an entire people, an entire system by the actions of a few people. We don't judge anyone. In religious law, you are not allowed to judge anyone. You relate to a human being as a human being. No boxes. Or is it black? Is it Jewish? Is it Christian? Is it an atheist? No. You relate to a human being as a human being because we come from the same source. We came from the same divine entity. We all have the same kind of feelings. Black people and white people don't have different types of feelings. A different type of blood. A different type of hunger. We all have the same thing. So we don't judge anybody. And he gives me a story. He says in tradition, in Sufi tradition, there are some people who enter the garden that got long sleeves with the wing kind of outfit. So two people were sitting together one day. 
And the one guy asked the other guy, why are you back long sleeves? So he says, we take the faults of people and we hide them inside here. <laughs> so he said, but you, you have no sleeves. So he says, I have no sleeves because we don't see the faults of people. <laughs> we have to stop seeking faults in this country. Stop finding faults with each other. You must be so busy looking at yourself. There's so many faults inside yourself, you want to have to look at anybody else. And that's the way we need to change society. Look at the fault of yourself, not others. So, I take this learning and I come back to South Africa. But the learning is strong now. The learning is on. I need to go back here. So the spiritual power puts me back. 6 August 1992, Thursday night. Thursday night for Muslims is Friday. We follow the lunar calendar. So our day starts at sunset the night before. So Friday for us is Thursday, Sunday. So at 10 p.m. on Thursday, the zikr takes place again. And suddenly after the zikr, the spiritual teacher just puts his head up, makes eye contact with me, and looks heavenwards. Those in the spiritual order who've been there for years before me said what happened that night has never, ever happened before. In fluent Turkish, and I don't speak a word of Turkish, he says to me, and I understood, Every single word that he said in Turkish. He said, My son, I'm not asking you. I'm instructing you to form an organization. The name in Arabic will be Wakful Wakifin. Translated, gift of the givers. You will serve all people of all races, all religions, all colors, all classes, all cultures, of any geographical location and of any political affiliation. But you will serve them unconditionally. You will expect nothing in return, not even a thank you. In fact, in what you're going to be doing for the rest of your life, I was 30 years old, expect to get a kick up your back. If you don't get a kick up your back, the guy is a bonus. Serve people with love, kindness, compassion, and mercy. And remember, the dignity of men is foremost. Let's stop it again. The country will not fall apart because people are angry. The people will not fall apart. The country will not fall apart because of class differences. The country will all fall apart if people lose their dignity. When you lose dignity, and when you are totally humiliated, there's no limit to what you can do when there's no hope and there are no consequences. Because you've got nothing to lose, you lost everything. As a collective, as government, as a private sector, as universities, as people, we need to do everything possible to save the dignity of every man, woman, and child in this country. And that's what our program is driving towards. He carries on. Go the naked, feed the hungry, provide water to the thirsty. And in everything that you do, be the best at what you do. Not because of ego. Ego is destructive. Ego is terrorism, ego is dictatorship, ego is avarice, ego is greed, ego is big trouble. Not because of ego, but because you're dealing with human life, human emotion, human dignity, and human suffering. Be the best. This country needs the best. We need skills and we need experience to change the lot of people in this country. We need the best experience, the best technology, the best people, the best skills, but above all, we need the best in Ubuntu in human dedication, and in human spirit. He goes on to say in Arabic, Khairun nas, nas. And that's what you see our shirts. Best among people are those who benefit mankind. He emphasizes it three times. He said, listen very carefully, my son. I'm not saying Muslim. I'm saying mankind. Not Arabs, not Indian, not Muslim. All people unconditionally. That's your dedication to serve everyone. And then he gives a spiritual message. Remember my son and don't ever forget this. Remember that whatever you do is done through you and not by you. And I can tell you that for 30 years what all you guys think we do is not humanly possible. The way we get to areas, the way things happen, it's not humanly possible. 
It takes too much explanation to tell you that. But after that session, after time with him was going on, I asked him at some point, I said, when you speak Turkish, I understand. When other people speak Turkish, I don't understand. <laughs> so it's asked, what's the issue here? <laughs> said, my son, when the hearts connect and the souls connect, the words become understandable. Mm -hmm. Ask him, now, okay, you give me all these things. I'm a doctor in private practice. I've got three surgeries. The place called Peter Marisburg in South Africa. What am I supposed to do? And then, after hours, public holidays, long weekends, what are you talking about? <laughs> Only one line. You will know what 30 years I do. What to do, how to do, what not to do, what to touch, what not to touch. In fact, I knew the moment I walked out of the place the same night, in 6 August 92, it came to me and responded to the civil war in Bosnia. The same month, not even five months later, the same month, I took in 32 containers of aid into a war zone in Bosnia. A few months later, I took in eight containers of war items, the chill factor in Eastern Europe, in winter, can be minus 21 degrees. So I took in the warm items. And the following year, we designed the world's first containerized mobile hospital. A product of South African technology, South African engineering, built in Pretoria and taken to Europe. And CNN, when they fill in the container hospital, they said the South African container hospital is equal to any of the best hospitals in Europe. Now we need to understand in this how much of us have faith in ourselves, in our country, in our people. We need to have faith in ourselves. In 2005, we were invited by the Bosnian government to come as guests of the country for what we did in the war. And they took us back to the hospital. And the hospital, the doctor in charge of the hospital is the same guy who was in charge in 93. Mm -hmm. And he says to me, you told us in this theater, we can do everything besides heart surgery. I said, yes, that's what I told you. He said, meet this lady. And this is the lady to me. And he said, we took our shrapnel from a heart in this hospital, in this container, in this theater that you guys gave us. And he said, you see these four children? They were born to this lady after the shuttle was taken out, and they were all born in the same container hospital. We identify South Africans as people who bring healing, who give life, who save the world. Why can't we do that in our country? Why can't we stand together as South Africans and make a difference in our own country? We have the spirit, we have the skills, we have the schools, we have the hospitals, we have everything. Why can't we do that? So when I did these three missions, 92, August 92, 32 containers, eight containers November, hospital 93, it came to me what my role was. Gift of the givers, in essence, was going to be a disaster response agency. We're going to be involved in every type of disaster, local and international, war, earthquake, flood, hurricane, tornadoes, tsunamis, everything. And everything else we do will be built around disasters. We got 31 categories of projects. Not 21 projects, 21 categories of projects. And each project got seven categories and they all run at the same time. So let's fast forward a little. It's a little bit over Africa, but I want you to understand a lot of human beings, the difficulty of people, because that makes us do what we're supposed to do. So we're going to Niger in 2005, August. That's a famine day. We land in the country and we see all these people. Men, women, and children, all hungry, all sick, and children dying by the, by the thousands. So we make an announcement that a medical team is here to give free service. And hundreds of them come. But there was something strange about those hundreds. No elderly people came, no adult male came, no teenager came, no big children came, no mother who came and brought a child asked for any treatment. I couldn't understand this. I said, what kind of people are this? They're not asking for help. And then when you start to realize with seven doctors, we're never going to go through this crowd. So when I went to the crowd, we started to yeah, get out. us to people on your feet, on the spot. So I go on the side, and I look at the child, and I say, this child is okay. So I tell the mother, she understood the language of the heart. She looks at me, gives a smile, and walks out. I said, how? Oh, let's try this again. So I did for the fourth time, the sixth time, the tenth time, and every time we do this, 
I says, I give a smile, and I say, go. And the mother gives me a big smile and walks away. All of them, they caught up on what we're doing. And they started pointing. I said, yes. And all the doctors started doing the same thing. Only the really six stayed behind. That gave us an opportunity to save the life of every malnourished child. Now what happened then? So that evening, we're sitting on one of the table. I got a system that when you travel with me, medical guys, media guys, government guys, so everyone comes in the evening, we all sit together and we share what we learned. So the Caesar Simulane, you used to be a this radio at the time. This is what he's saying now. Comes and he says, Dr. Solomon, you know, I went to the villages of Kirabari. In every village, in every place, in every street, three children were dying a day. I said, stop. I know what happened. That's what you mean. I said the people of Niger made the supreme sacrifice. No old people came. No elderly came. No adults came. No teenagers came. No mother came. No big children came. And they walked out of the tree. You know why? Because they did not want to eat our resources. They wanted us to save those other children. Even though their children may die in seven days or in ten days' time, they sacrificed their own children because that child may still have ten days to die. So they walk out of the queue so that you can save the child who will die this afternoon or this evening. That was the spirit, the Ubuntu, the spirituality of the people of Africa. It's something I can't forget. When we gave them food parcels and they ran out, they didn't fight, they didn't scream. This is my brother, you didn't get. Take some sugar from me. And they started battling some got sugar, some got oil, some got flour. They started sharing to make sure, in a state of famine, when there's no food, there's no guarantee what you'll eat in three days' time. But they had the willingness to share whatever little they had. South Africa is it. We need to apply the same philosophy, the same thing, the same qualities, this will save this country. This is what we're going to do. I'm going to give you two more examples. The same year, in October 2005, we land in Pakistan, an earthquake that was a monster. It struck from Rawalpindi to Muzaffarabad. It took our entire region, not one city, an entire region, 400 villages sent into the ground. We landed in the airport. The Pakistan, Shatani, Pakistani general comes to us and says, do you mind not going to the earthquake? So I told him, which hospital will you give me? Do you understand? I said, yes, I understand. He said, I'll give you the cantonment hospital of Rabat Pindi. My team's asking me, uh, let me come here to help I said, yes. Don't you understand what the man is telling you? The man is telling you that everything is gone on the top. No hospitals, no people, nothing. Nothing is functional there. There's nothing available on the top. Everything has to be brought down. We can't do anything there. So that's why I asked him for the hospital. But we need to find those ones at the top of our life and stabilize them. Ask him, do you have helicopters? He said, my friend, you can see our state. We've got all helicopters trying to bring the live ones back down. Unfortunately, we don't have any helicopters up. The only way is road transport. They'll all be there by the time you get into road transport. It's too far the mountain. So I look around the airport and I say, oh, American Air Force, something good here. <laughs> and you know, Muslims and Americans are always hiding. <laughs> so, in any case, we go to the American Air Force and I see a big black I say, My brother, where are you from? I know where he's from. <laughs> <laughs> he says, I'm from America. I said, You black? You're from Africa. He said, Yes, my brother, I'm originally from Africa. <laughs> Me too, I'm from Africa. I need your help. My brothers, what else do you need? I said, I need a helicopter to go to the mountains. Oh no, my brother, <laughs> take three. <laughs> two, three helicopters in two minutes. Two black hawks and another helicopter. He understood the language of the heart. He understood the need of the hour. If I had to get the two governments talking, I'll still be ready for the helicopter. <laughs> but he was brave enough to make a decision that was important to save the lives of people. That's another important message for us. Civil servants, gentlemen and men, and teachers and doctors, and everybody in civil service, you have an allegiance to your people, to the country, not to a political party. You have to make sure that everything you do is in the interest of the people. And let me give you an example. 
in Nonzamo in Scam, April 2020. Ali was there, in Scam, in Nonzamo. It was close to not done never time. Eight o'clock shut out. Can't do anything. So all people are waiting in the queue for food parcels. Walking stick, very old, couldn't move about. The queue was long. It was freezing that April when he came, came out. And social distancing, everything going to take much longer and further apart. So at eight o'clock, the police comes and says, stop. Can't do anymore. So I said, jump in the lake, fall on your head. Tell me that they want to want to me up, but we're not going to stop to do this. You see, he understood the language of the heart. He said, You're right. We can't leave all people angry. So he breaks the law. The police guy breaks the law in the interest of the people of Africa. And he calls for reinforcements. And he says, Police come here, we need your help. All people can't walk home late at night in the school. Put them in a van and take them home. So the police come, and the vans come, and those people go in the van. And then the last old lady gets a food pass for somebody at half past 12 in the morning. And she says to the next time, I'm going home now, and I'm going to wake my grandchildren. So they said, why are you doing something so crazy? <laughs> she said, when I left home, my grandchildren looked at me with hope in the eyes, and I was coming with something. I was coming with something. My grandchildren haven't eaten for three days. I had to wake them up at that part of the morning to show the difficulty. They're home, they pray at first answer, and I brought something. That's the condition of 2020. It's still very prevalent right now. And so the teams go to the mountain and they bring the people down, and we go to the cantonment hospital from our community. We get the stench of death, the stench of gangrene. We walk inside that children are orphans. No IV lines, no stretches, no nursing staff, no detectives, no functional ICU. It's a mess. So I call the police, the Pakistani general, I say, what is this? Is this an organized killing field? What's going on here? He said, what happened? And the superintendent comes running and says, don't you know, general, we decommissioning this hospital. I said, you guys are crazy. When you hospitals are damaged, you can't shut down any hospital. So he said, what you want to do? So I said, if I give you a shopping list, can you bring this to me? And I'll show you what other regions can do. He said, it's fine. Why is this talking to us? We see teams from the northern countries coming. Where are you from? They ask us. They look from Fuel now. Indian, black, white, Muslim, Hindu, African guy with big voice, guy with Martin, my mother, my head. All from Fuel. So we said, we're from Africa. Oh, what do you come here for? You guys always want three things. <laughs> what did you come to fetch from Pakistan? I said, we came to bring something to Pakistan. You will eat your words. So the general brings what we asked for. In less than 24 hours, a hospital that was shutting down in Pakistan, we converted it into a 400 bed emergency hospital. Does it staff? Doctors, disinfectant, equipment, ICU, everything became functional. And we started saving lives, and the helicopters would bring the people down. Our helicopters, and all but now American helicopters. And all that stuff. And, and, and people from all over coming in. And I called the guys from the northern countries. I said, You're most welcome to your hospital. <laughs> the medical teams followed, and they did whatever they did. And again, the power of unity of religion. In December, a, girl, a lady called Karina X. Year, calls me from Victoria University and says, Dr. Suleiman, I'd like to go to Pakistan. So I said, when? He said, on Christmas. I said, Karina, are you feeling well? <laughs> you're an Afrikaner, you're a Christian, and 25th December, you want to be in a Muslim family? You can't be feeling well. She says, it's the only league I got. So Karina goes to Pakistan. Spinal rehab specials. She takes the Ubuntu from Pretoria into Rawalpindi in Islamabad. She makes the children walk who can't walk. When she finishes off in that stint, the military cries, the doctors cry, the nurses cry, the patients cry, and the family cries. She brought something totally invaluable to the people of Pakistan. And when she came back, she brought one of the children back to Pakistan, South Africa. 
I have to make sure that that child walks. Right? You see, there's no boxes, no race, no religion, no color. This country has got this endemic problem. We need to break it. We have to break it. There's no other way to go forward in this country. No more race, no more box, no more religion. It's about human beings as human beings. 2010, that's the last example I'll give you in terms of international. We got a call. I learned I just come from Syria I call the madness man. I walk into my house, the radio station calls me, says, Have you heard? There's an earthquake in Haiti. I said, I'm still walking in my house. <laughs> Put the TV on. I look at the screen and said, I can tell you now, in this screen alone, there's more than 25,000 people dead. In 40 seconds, it wiped out 250,000 people. He said, Are you going to respond? I said, Yes. Our search and rescue teams will be ready within the hour. We make arrangements with Turco and the French consulate. We get a striking visa in 10 minutes. No paperwork, no pictures, nobody on site. We just get it. <laughs> so I said, in, in, in the camp, I will do Air France to courtesy. But we booked the tickets to Air France. Get us border friends. I said, Will you get me the border friends? They said, Yes. I said, You won't. They said, We will. I said, You won't. <laughs> So I said, give me a guaranteed writing. They gave me a guaranteed writing. We kept me the border for that. Oh, big mistake. In any case, they write the thing down. The teams get ready. They get to the airport. They have our flight. Once they get ready to go, I phoned the Catholic Society of Johannesburg. I said, hello. I don't know you, but I need a boat. <laughs> for 10 seconds, this guy took the boat. I said, Hey, are you with the Christian guys not connected? The Muslim guys are connected all over the world. <laughs> so he said, well, what do you want to talk for? So I said, I want a Catholic organization to meet my teams in Dominican Republic and take them across to the border of France. He called me three hours later, he said that. Caritas and CRS, Catholic Relief Services, will meet your team in Dominican Republic. My teams land in Paris. I get a penny call. There's a problem. I said, I know, border branch is closed. You guys are flying in the next two hours on another flight to Dominican Republic. Yes, and never. They get to Dominican Republic, what? So I make a team right up. Accommodation, transport, water, food, visa, everything arranged. And a compound in which to work on the other side with the Mexican team. We partnered the Mexican team. We have to share the dog. We didn't have the dog, we have the dog. We share the dog. <laughs> so in any case, we get to the other side, and they're just shooting and looting the streets. And then, Eight days later, 20th January 2010, the South African king makes world history. Never before in the history of the African continent has any African king taken anybody out of another alive an earthquake outside the African continent. 20th January 2010, the Collapsed Catholic Church, 64 year old Erazizi was inside. Eight days. No oxygen, no food, no water, tractor team. No medical care, completely in level, and the team's pulled out al alive. And the first words were, I love God Almighty. We instilled faith into somebody several thousand kilometers away. And the second thing she said, I love you. <laughs> because it's about love, it's about service, it's about sacrifice, it's about dedication. The medical teams followed behind the search and rescue teams. And again, from northern countries, they said, This is not possible. Everything's destroyed. The South African team stepped forward, Dr. Johnny Nadir and Hannes Dubert and others. And they said, the Burbank are planned. <laughs> and for the credit of the South African team and, and of course to the, the Northern Country teams, they said, if you want healing and you want life and you want to be safe, then go to the Dream Team. And the Dream Team is from South Africa, trained in our country, in our universities, in our schools with the spirits. So let's finish up here on one last point international. But the message applies to our continent, it applies to our home, it applies to the spirit is the same. And we talk about and because of you. We are because of these teams. And I'll tell you a little bit about these teams. So in disaster situations, some people send tents, blankets, food, medicine, sanitary pads, diapers, nutritional biscuits, energy, bottled water. Some people send ten primary health care teams. Some people send trauma teams, general surgeon, orthopedic surgeon, vascular surgeon, neurosurgeon, paper nurse, ICU nurse. 
Some people said post doc rehab specialists, like a spinal rehab specialist, like Karina. Some people said trauma counselors. Some said surgery distributors. Some said doc. Some said medically focused. Some said surgery distributors. Some people upgrade clinics. Some people upgrade hospitals. Some people burn hospitals. Some people burn houses. Some people re support agriculture. And in cases where it's a conflict situation, where there's hostage situations, and somebody's taken hostage, people send in hostage negotiators. With the only team in the world that does all of the above. Every single team. We can get on a plane and set up an ICU and a theater on a runaway. In Somalia, in three hours, we set up an entire hospital for ICU, theaters, gynae, pediatrics, casualty, emergency, dietetics, physiotherapy, dental care, everything in three hours. We set up an entire hospital. That's the skill of our people. But now, the teacher said, the eyes can't do the work of the ear. The ear can't do the work of the head. The hand can't do the work of the heart. But all this is defined by the function of the body. Each of the gills can't function without its teeth. It supports staff, the donors, the media, the public, even the government with all the support, international relations. We all need it together. We all stand together. These doctors <coughs> come from the most expensive homes in South Africa. They have the most expensive cars. But when they come to disasters, they like an outside switch. The bombs fly over here. They're shooting in the streets. There's no proper sanitation. There's no proper water. There's no proper food. And these people put up their hands over and over and over again to come, keep coming back. Coming back, all the luxury at home. They keep coming back to be in a war zone, an earthquake, a some difficult situation. Because they say, when we go out, we find spirituality. We find God Almighty. When we go, we don't eat. We receive. That's the quality of the medical teams. And all my staff, the background staff, the admin, the packer, the sweeper, everyone works in sync. Everybody knows the system. Everybody is valuable. Everybody is spiritual. Everybody knows they got a job to, to save people. It's not a normal job. It's about job of saving lives. About having goodness and promoting it all the time. So in 2016, November, I killed all international marketing. Not the projects, just the marketing. Because too much focus was on international stuff. People didn't know what we're doing locally. I'm just gonna give you a few examples. 2017, we responded to the uh, fire in Naisla. And for the first time, people saw our capability. We sent in two ladies to project management situation. And they supervised the distribution of 20,000 food parcels. But could we do this alone? No. Open companies came to the super leads. And Checkers Shop right said, take our car park. There's no way else. Take the car park. So he said, where are your shoppers that are going to shop? Where are you going to park? They said, don't worry about the shoppers. Just take the car park. <laughs> Who makes that kind of sacrifice? Mm. It shows there's compassion in commercialization. And they gave us the car park. But we said, the problem is the super lead can't go up there. It's too big. So from across the road, somebody brings a forklift and say, here's a forklift. And the people of Niza stuck and lining up all the buckets. What? Four by fours in the bucket and said, put inside there, we take it up, we offload it, we bring the buses and bring it back down. It was a community spirit. CEOs of companies, MDs, financial directors, everybody coming together to help poor regional media alike. It was a real spirit of South Africa. 20,000 food buses, blankets, hygiene packs, sandwich beds, everything was delivered. That was not enough. We sent in firefighters. We supported 1,200 firefighters daily for liquids, for energy biscuits, for hot meals. We send in advanced life support paramedics. We send in advanced life support ambulance. We send in specialist medical teams that even deliver babies, look after the patients, move them from Nysla to George and other hospitals. And whilst we were doing that, somebody came and said, you know, in all these days, we forgot to feed the cats and the dogs. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we brought in 30 tons of cat and dog food the animals were having a party. <laughs> and then somebody came and said, what about the animals? It's drought here. That's why we made a fire. So I said, what now? The sheep, cattle, horses, pigs, animals in the wild, and elephant in the park. So we supported all of those things. <laughs> and then a guy came and said, we lost 22 million years in the fire. The case honeybee is the most versatile, most resilient bee in the world. It is haploid and tetroid. 
it can make the old queen be the queen be dies. It's resilient at South African zoosocial. I will support them for money to grow new plants, to buy nectar pollen substitute, we give them 300 new hives, and we give them a sugar, sugar, they need the sugar to feed the bees in the meantime. There's a research center in Nigeria now. People go there for academic purposes, professors, students, everybody goes. South Africans take care of all the creatures. They take care of the bee, the animals, all the things in the ocean. All that is a source of blessing. Once we're doing that, the calls came, Sutherland is falling apart. The sheep cow, the marino sheep, the price marino sheep is dying from 440,000. It's becoming 400,000, 300,000, 300,000. And some farmers even shot themselves. The tragedy of losing everything. And at the same time, Beaufort West, disasters fall. There's no water. They can't find water. We sent in our hydrologist, hydrologist, Quinian Kunamal, into Beaufort West. We found water. We pumped water from the bowls into the Hakka Dam, down the road, in, in by gravity, into the, into the system. Municipal water system and from the into the city. And we put balls in all the homes and the schools. And then at the same time, we started selling truckloads of water to, to Sutherland. In June 2018, they cried. They said, the father is no good now. All the boreholes are dry. There's no more water. We said in the team again, Martin Landman, but running head, drill 238 balls of the farmers. To save the sheep at our cost. It was not about white or farmer, by developed farmer or commercial farmer. It was about South African people in trouble. If the farmers go down, the farm workers go down. The economy goes down. We all suffer what happens in the whole country. Is affected. The price of meat goes up everywhere. Inflation affects us. So we said, let's save it. January this year, for the first time in 2022, the sheep count started rising. People started re growing. When we were delivering food to the farmers, to the farm workers, the farmers said that, do you mind giving us a food parcel also? We don't have anything to eat. Yeah. Our credit cards are mixed. Our bank loans are full. The co-ops don't give us any more stuff. And even when you bring the fodder, we don't have money to put fuel in the van to go fetch the fodder. We can't. We took our kids out of school. We took them out of university. We are hungry. We really travel. We did travel now. And we support them. Fully and of course, they made a lot of efforts themselves. I'm going to go into the last two stories, three stories. 2020 was a real crisis for South Africa and the world. COVID came. We walked into 210 hospitals in the country. We set up specific, specific, specialized oxygen facilities for beds and linen and oxygen points, delivering oxygen machines, CFAC machines, hydro laser oxygen machines. We do any those scrubs. We produce 12,000 sets of scrubs, surgical uniforms, surgical gowns, PPEs, masks, sanitizer. We went and we started upgrading hospitals, putting boards in all the different hospitals. And here we commend the healthcare people in South Africa. In the most difficult situation, when they lost colleagues, when they lost family members, when they lost patients, and the mood was depressive, they carried on working even though they were under staff. They were the real heroes. Of this country. The police people on the road, when they were doing the roadblocks, they had no PPEs. I supplied the police with the minister, the deputy, the commissioners, and all the provinces on the road. We supplied them with coffee and tea and, and PPEs, and all that came from corporate South Africa. And the real savior for this country came when I know we can save this country because corporate South Africa finally didn't worry about money anymore. The CEOs of the companies called me. And said, forget the CSI divisions. Forget about 90% DE points. Forget about a tax certificate. Forget about coverage in the media. Just tell us how do we save our people and how do we save our country? What do you want? You see, the most important lesson from COVID was this that money meant nothing. Yes. Your status meant nothing. Your wealth meant nothing. Your network meant nothing. Your connections meant nothing. Because you're going to be in a billionaire. And you're going to be somebody from rural class life standing in the line waiting for an oxygen machine mm -hmm. and waiting for a bed in the ICU ward. Your relationship with the president, with the health minister, with the heads of the healthcare uh, hospitals in the country meant nothing. If there was no bed, you're going to die outside the hospital. Mm -hmm. Our medical ethics will not allow us to take a poor patient out of the bed because you're a billionaire. It's not going to happen. Thank God for this country. That's what the ethics and the principles. It's not going to happen. And many rich people died. They flew to Botswana. They flew to the Sudan. They flew to other parts of the world. From Germany came from Joba. Joba came into Cape Town. 
people went to different hospitals looking for death because COVID destroyed everything. And in that process of COVID destroying everything, we delivered food parcels, 1.4 million food parcels. And we support the soup kitchens everywhere. And I'm going to finish up with the story here. And then we can have questions after that. Because I can talk about the floods, I can talk about the summer of this. You're going to be here the whole night. <laughs> 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 you guys <laughs> So in June 2015, not too far from here, we delivered four parcels of this for very decent care. A mother comes very dignified and takes a food parcel. And then she says, talk to my children. They will tell you the taste of every plant in this area. For the last six months, they've eaten plants to survive. Our staff, Corinne and I, were witnesses on the dark sites when the dark trucks came. Children ran to the dump, to the start coming from the dump trucks. A child takes a jam that puts it at his mouth to eat. A jam that is related, it can cause infection and can cause bleeding, but the child is hungry. Another child takes a finger and puts it in a peanut butter bottle to catch whatever is there to eat because it's hungry. We have seen this a day and four, we don't know what to eat. Those people wait for scratch to survive. In one of the soup kitchen queues, a child comes, small child, July. 2020. It's freezing cold. No shoes. No shirt. No jersey. No hat. No jacket. He comes shaking to the people like this and says, I'm hungry, but I won't eat too much of food. Will you give me food for my mother, my father, my brother, and my sister? I won't eat too much. They haven't eaten for the whole week. So I won't eat. Can you give me food for them? The child became a symbol of what South Africa should be, of what adults should be. Altruistic, sacrificial, ethical, spiritual, set, set an example. It was prepared to sacrifice his own food so that his parents and his family members could eat. How are we doing that? Are we supporting South Africa? Are we forgotten where we come from? People go on to get expensive jobs and forget where they come from. We forgot our parents, we forgot the old people, we forgot the pensioners, we forgot our values. We need to change the system. And right now, as I'm talking to you, the children die every day of starvation in the Eastern Cape. That's why when they say, I'm going to cause an uprising, won't. So South Africans are very patient people, very resilient. Take the difficulty. You know why they die, mother? Because it is very normal to starve in the Eastern Cape. So when they not starve in the Eastern Cape, they think it's very normal for the child to starve in the Eastern Cape. By the time they bring the child to the clinic, it's too late. The child dies. So then we partnered the healthy part and the dietitians and went on an education program. That's <coughs> this is what happened when you look out for this starvation and nutrition. We need to bring the kids really to the hospital. But talking is not good enough. We need to give something to eat. So we started giving what is called easy in that face. It's a special product, a Norwegian product. You tear it open, you squeeze once in the morning, you squeeze once in the afternoon. Protein, energy, and rich. Vitamin to the rich, they take it, they eat it, and they feel good. So, to God Almighty's grace, the people who make the product saw our social media pages and they said, We want to help the people of South Africa. We're sending you 15 containers. They sent us 15 containers of easy pillar paste value at 25 million rand. Outsiders can read. Why can't we read? Internet. I think I must, I must end up with one small final story. The floods in this Indian UK is again. 11 April 2022. No call came from anybody saying, I need a boat, I need a helicopter, I need a diver. No calls like that came. The calls came from corporate South Africa at one o'clock in the morning and said, What do you need and how much money do you need to have the people of KwaZulu Natal? When you bring compassion into commercialization, no country is going to collapse. They came and I said, you guys cannot be free well. They said, why? I said, you stay up at night to give away money and not to make money. They said, we know what it is. We learned from COVID. We know the difficulty of people. We want to save our country. And the final, the most beautiful story of all, the bridge collapsed in our mercy. And people said, we're not ready for government. We're going to fix it ourselves. So engineers came and said, our time is free. Architects said, our time is free. And people who provide the material said at cost discounted against some donation. Other people said we can give money. 
the people from Nandalani and Polani, informal settlements in Lamasi, came forward and said, we're part of the country. We're part of the community. But we lost all our houses. We lost all our positions. We lost all our furniture. We lost our children. We lost adult people. We lost jobs. We don't have anything. But whatever we earn, whatever money we can take out, we will take out our money and make a contribution towards this breach because we are South Africa. We are one community. Ladies and gentlemen, don't allow any individual political party or thinker, influencer to cause disturbances between us. Anybody who brings conflict, racism, discord, is to promote civil unrest, people like steals money, state capture, people like that we call traitors and anti patriots As South Africans, we stop traitors and anti patriots We will not allow them to destroy this country. This country does not belong to the government. It belongs to me, to you, and 65 million South Africans. We take ownership of this country because to be fair to government, 7 million people's taxes can't look after 65 million people. It's impossible. But for so much unemployment, we need to hold hands of the good people in government. And remember the teacher said in the beginning, don't judge everybody. Yes, you may have people with bad habits. It doesn't make them bad people. So in government, everybody is not corrupt. In the police services, everybody's got a bad cop. What about the lady in Henry Jan management? When the floods came, the police lady jumped into the water. Not to save a life, but to save, find the body of a child and the body of an old man. She drowned in the process. Who was there to comfort the child when the body came home? Now we're going to say, bad cop, rotten cop, corrupt cop, or steal something. We are doing a great disservice. When we start making everything negative, we destroy spirituality. We destroy the soul. We destroy good deeds. The final message, the teacher said, no matter how many faults people have, always look for the good inside the people. And always promote the good in the people. And you keep promoting good, the universal lesson, and good will flow. Ladies and gentlemen, there's no need to leave this country. This is the greatest country on earth. We survived 94. You can survive 94. You can survive anything. Mm -hmm. I've been to 45 countries. I've seen them tear each other apart. Revenge, hatred, killing, meaning, children, men, women, they kill everybody mercilessly. People talk 94. Let's stop buying food. Keep the passport ready. We're going to run from here. There's going to be crisis in this country. The people of this country showed in good spirit. They showed resilience. They showed respect. They showed a forgiving nature. We survived that. We can survive anything. Bring dignity back to the people. All hands together, no race, no religion, no color, no class, only human as a human, no judging, only good words, and do the simplest things. We have a teaching, whoever does it, atoms made of wood, shall see it. No need to be project. Somebody in your own house, your neighbor, your family, your village, down the road, the street, just let's fix everything. Let's just get involved. Bring the teachers back. Bring the retired teachers, retired doctors, retired police work, retired lifesavers, retired rescue people, retired engineers. Bring everybody back. This country needs skills and experienced people. Mm -hmm. We can save this country. Yes. We will save this country. And we will fix this country. Thank you very much. In the world of darkness, we remain a beacon of hope. Yes. Thank you, Dr. Sulema. Ladies and gentlemen, I will now open up the call for questions. There will be two rolling mics, one on this side and one on that side, and I'll take one question from each individual. <laughs> Right, on this side of here, I'll make questions. Our hunt in the center. Here's a lady over there. Um, there are several calamities occurring concurrently. What would be the determining factor as to which? The first condition is in Africa, the African disaster that comes first. 
you can look after your country at first. Secondly, the head of state of a country that's a disaster will make an announcement and it can actually happen. They don't make an announcement, we don't make a move. In many cases, when they had the segments, it was a big, the government said, Kerry, we don't need any outside help. India from 2000, or since the time of the tsunami, doesn't accept any outside help. I'll just give you two examples. But, but, but a call has to be made from the international, from the head of state to say, please help. When that happens, we need to check are the alliance countries will help us, the countries that from next to our help, or do we respond? But if it's something very, very big, like the Haiti earthquake, the earthquake of Nepal, the typhoon Ariane in the Philippines, or, or the tsunami itself. And in Africa, of course, it doesn't have to be so big, but most of the countries don't have the capacity to respond. We want to do something big, we'll be ready to respond immediately because we know they don't have the skills, they don't have the expertise, or they don't have the resources to do that. So we'll respond immediately to Africa and internationally if required. And now the things have changed. In the past, we made the announcement, now the countries call us, the embassies call us. They said, we make all arrangements, please ask arrangements, receive on the other side, we need your teams, we need your help. So we will do that. So instantly, if something big, we respond. If something that can wait, we we'll wait to see what happens. But, but remember, in earthquakes and that kind of disasters, time is important. You save lives in the first few days, not coming several days later. So we don't go on four or five key people at a time. We take a team of 60 or more. We take a huge team to maximum impact the fastest amount of time. In, in, in Cyclone Nidai, the effect is Mozambique, Malawi, Zimbabwe, and there were floods in Devon at the same time. We responded to all four countries at the same time. We've never done that before, but we did all four at the same time. In Mozambique, we were the only team in the world that had five helicopters. No government, no agency had helicopters. We had helicopters in Mira, we had ground crews in Estequina, we had boats, we had divers, we had pilots, we had off-road rescues. We only got the communication system that was working across the, the sea to the other side of the river. We, we, we have that kind of capability to do that kind of stuff. I would just like to thank you for listening to the message of God's delivered to you all those years ago. And also, I have seen a small section of the work in the hospitals here in Fort Elizabeth. We will daily send me out 200 sandwiches with the thousands of patients waiting to be seen. And I would like to thank you for your kindness and your team for doing that. And I see what a difference and how much dignity is provided to those of the children who have come from all over South, all over the Eastern Cape, and to the mothers and the elderly as well. Just one small little gesture of that. So I would say this is just a message of thank you for your kindness and compassion. On this side of the office room, are there any questions? <laughs> right, we'll take one there. Oh. Thank you very much. Um, good evening, everyone. My name is Elijah Nyati. And I'm Nelson Mandela, a university student. Um, Dr. Suman, my question uh, derives from, from uh, the previous speaker's question that, um, which actually I want to ask how do you, or how do the deep rural areas in any, in any province reach out to you? Because uh, I think we've seen with the government, I think it struggles to, to reach out with the, with the uh, rural areas, whenever there's uh, an event like any, any natural disaster. Now, how do in that situation do they reach out to you when they have not been able to reach out to the government, you know, when they seek help? Because, for, for example, I, I, um, in my uh, rural area where my grandmother stays, I've never seen any news reporter, I've never seen any news company. Uh, now, how do we then, uh, or how do then do they uh, reach out to you when they need help? Because I've never, for example, seen any any you know 
any situation that has happened in those kind of rural areas in TV, for example, or in, or, or in main or in news or what call this in mainstream news. So now uh, we then struggle with the government or any other foundation which is which is a bit familiar to yours, they struggle to reach out to certain areas because of you know the limited media in our country. Or well, I can say maybe the, the media is quite uh, are focused on certain things, but not focused on you know the, the poverty that, uh, that is out there in the, in the, in the rural areas. Now, how do we reach out to you? Thank you very much. We need to understand that our response is a disaster response. We are very focused in terms of disasters, right? It's not everything else. But what that they are different categories of disasters. But when anything happens, like that storm that hit in Atata two years ago, in the rural areas, in other storms, it's the government that calls us. The people and the government call us to respond. We get local councillors, we get a lot of our members are known throughout the country. My staff members are known throughout the country. Mayors, police for Jackson, they said yes, they call us. They said, look, we need your help to come here, Jackson. In other parts of our traffic, also the police that call us. That, you know, when the storm came. So we had we have either emerged the disaster management, or the SAPS, or the world councillor, or the mayor, or rural people call us. And sometimes, you know, there's a lot of small media in community media all over in Eastern Middle East. And they will call us and say we need help. And we will then assess the situation. We go in, that's not a disaster. But now, what reputation is not something that's visible, you can't see. It. You know, we just know about it. And when we start getting feedback like that, like when we go to the hospitals, they will tell us the hospitals. We do that all the time, we keep relationships. And then also, we tell us reputation is like it. And then sometimes we pick it up from the media itself to say, look, the media does ask us to or this report said this, this under, so we go and check it out. And then we will respond. So, like that, throughout the country, people do for us, especially for few disasters. And they say now there's no one in front of the So then we get involved with walls, or we get involved with some disaster invention or some medical support. So people do know how to get all of us. Thank you very much for that question. The final question will come from the gentleman who's to you. Thank you. Uh, my name is Ukaine Luganga, and I'm a finished minister. But first, I would like to thank uh, all the work that you guys do with the people that give us. Um, you know, in my in my in my in my course, we learned a lot about you guys, and in, in your speech, you spoke about uh, corporate a lot. I think you mentioned it a few times. So then we learned about federal capitalism. Uh, we're in uh, big companies and billionaires and agencies. We learned about the ways that uh, at the end of the day, it them. So um, we also learned about uh, the billion minutes on issue, which has a lot of power in public policy. Uh, we learned about something called the green chip. Uh, which is essentially um, just become difficult for for for, 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 for organizations such as the world leaders organizations to pass police without you know reference of any without uh, um, uh, engaging with the feeling in the foundation. So I like, I'd like to just understand that the that the people they give us and people get it. As I said at the beginning, we don't do Judge anybody. The spiritual teachers say if somebody wants to do good, we accept the good for the one the person does. Because no man can read the intention of the soul of any person. We don't know that. And when people do good, you encourage the good. But I can see the transformation. I've seen that people call for the purpose of just getting points and call for the difference for wanting to help. Because in COVID itself, a lot of people saw the company staff pass on. They saw family members pass on. And they saw the hunger. People, I'll give you an example. We got calls early uh, March, May, June of 2020. A person calls and says, I'm an airline manager. And another person calls and says, I'm a hotel manager. I have an expensive house. I have an expensive car. I have a kids in private school. I'm losing my house. I'm losing my car. I took my kids out of private school. Right now, I don't have food in my house. From that status, you went right down. So people, when they saw that situation, Realize there is something more than just giving for the sake of giving, but giving for altruistic purpose. And I was very me on the 11th of April 2022. They were not even from KZN. What does that matter to them? Because the you know, that's not the case of their problem. But they phoned and they were not interested in media coverage. They were not interested in anything that nobody's going to know they, they gave money. They did it because as a compassion, because although they are corporate, they are still human in essence. And the human part was talking rather than the popular part. 
And that's what made the difference. So yes, I encourage corporates to make money in the right way, because we have a teaching, there's no harm in making money, as long as you make it the right way. But remember, there's a share for those who need it, who need your assistance, you will be generous about the need. So, and we've survived COVID, the flood, and all the crises that have become financial. It's because of the generosity of corporates. At least we're getting something. In other places, people get nothing. So for that, we great. Thank you very, very much. Thank you, Dr. Suleiman, um, and for that very, very enlightening presentation. Thank you. We really appreciate it. A round of applause, please. I would like to call our deputy dean up to the podium, um, Professor Michelle May, to do the vote on next. My job's the easiest of the night, I think, and I just have to say thank you to a few people. As you're aware, a function like tonight takes a team, and I want to thank Paul and his team, Tian, Shirley, Ruan, and everyone else that has made tonight possible. So thank you very much. Our Dean, Professor Hendrik Lloyd, for his leadership, his vision, his wisdom in leading our faculty and for creating the environment where we can put on this type of event and share it with the public and share your expertise and your wisdom and your vision with us. So thank you for energizing us tonight. To our guests here tonight, um, thank you for joining us and hope you'll join us in lots of future events. Lastly, Dr. Suleiman, thank you for your time and for your team's time. And um, we know how busy you are. Uh, it's very really difficult to get to you to commit to a day, but thank you very much for your generosity of spirit, your vision, and for putting action to your vision. Um, we appreciate you as the whole of South Africa, Africa and the world does, um, but you've really made a difference. You reminded us that we are the dream team. We can be the dream team. Nelson Mandela said a good head and a good heart is a formidable combination, and we see that in you and your team. Thank you very much. I'm going to tap into my There's very few. I can give him instructions. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for your attendance this evening. It has been a pleasure to host you and our esteemed guest, um, presenter, Dr. Suleiman. The strap line of the university is change the world. And I encourage you to go out this evening into the world and to create that change one person at a time. Remember, each person whom you meet in life is not a coincidence. The meeting serves purpose, and you might not understand that purpose at the precise moment of your meeting, but that meeting will serve purpose. Like a freshman, ladies and gentlemen, will now be served in the foyer. And a note, a sideline note that all catering is strictly allowed. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, and a safe journey home. Thank you.